Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. My plan is sound, mathematically sound. It cannot fail. It's perfect. Three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Independent for life. Another Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales. Many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the amazing tale of Fool's Gold. Herbert Lang is chief teller of the Amalgamated Bank. A thrifty man of 43, Herbert has been an employee at a small salary for over 20 years. Honest and punctual, his reputation is above reproach. Herbert is thin, slightly bald, bespectacled, and unmarried. Herbert is a poor man, but he has a plan. He won't always be poor, because he's developed his plan for ten years. And ten years should bring mathematical perfection to any plan. For five years now, it has been working. And by the first of June, three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Herbert studies the figures on the little pad before him. Writes a total of 50,000 and smiles behind his bifocals. Then an abrupt sound breaks his meditation. Everett? Huh? The auditor has just found another shortage and they've traced it. Shortage? Another? Yes. $3,000. Uh, they've traced it? Definitely. Third one this year. Uh, and to whom did they trace it, Mr. Favor? That young fellow, Barton. He denies it, of course, but the evidence is all against him. Barton, I... I can't understand what happens to young men lately. I do my best to hire the ones I think are on him. I wish you'd exercise a little more care. Oh, I know they have the best of references. I should think by now you'd be able to judge character at a glance. I'd have sworn by that boy, Mr. Favor. Yeah. They've taken him down to the police station. Oh, what a shame. Very embarrassing, Mr. Favor. I feel as though I'm responsible. Oh, now, don't take it that way, Herbert. After all, we're insured. But it is annoying to both of us. We all make mistakes in judgment now and then. Besides, you had your nose to the wheel without a vacation for three years now. It doesn't pay, Herbert. You'll crack up. Well, I haven't felt as though I needed a vacation. And besides, when I do take one, I'd like to have it all in one lump. I've always wanted to tour Europe or some foreign land. Or two weeks mean nothing. I understand. I feel the same way, but what chance is there? I do think you need a rest from this place. I'll let you know when I'm really tired, Mr. Faber. Hmm. I doubt it. I will say that I admire your devotion to duty. Thank you, Mr. Faber. It's good to hear you say that. I want you to know that I appreciate the opportunity of being with the firm for 20 years. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a board of directors meeting this afternoon. I'm going to try to get you a raise. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Whatever they decide will be for the best. I wouldn't want the board to think I was dissatisfied here. You're 43, Herbert, and alone, unmarried. That isn't right. And you're not the type of man to tackle marriage on your salary. (laughs) Well, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> I have plans. I, I've saved a bit. I found the right woman. I, oh, Miss Faber, I, I may surprise you one of these days. Hmm. Yeah. Up into my office after the board meeting. I may have some news for you. Uh, make it around three. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Herbert sits at his desk, smiling. What complete confidence they have in him. What a perfect setup. Three thousand more accounted for. Three more months and I'll have reached my goal. Fifty thousand and independent for life in South America. With a move of sudden decision, Herbert slaps on his hat, walks out of the bank and pays a visit to Hazel Yates at her apartment. What are you doing away from the bank at this hour of the day, Herbert? I'm out to lunch. I thought I'd drop by. Oh, that's nice. I'm certainly surprised. Uh... Hazel, exactly three months from now, I'm going to take a vacation. You certainly need one. 
Hey, it's been ages since you've been away from your work for more than a day. Yes, I know, but I had to keep my nose to the grindstone. But now it's different. What do you mean? Well, I, I've kept it a secret, but now I can tell you. Uh, I'm going to get married. Married? Herbert, you, you're going to get married. That's right. But I, I thought you never considered marriage because you felt you couldn't support a wife. Oh, that's true, but now it's different. I didn't want to say anything till I was sure. What are you talking about? Hazel, for seven years now, I've been working on a problem, a plan, a plan that cannot fail. Because it's mathematically correct. What? I heard it. You frighten me. Uh, it, it has to do with the stock market. I've worked it over and over. Stock market? Gambling. Oh, no, no, not gambling. Not the way I worked it out. <laughs> Lots of people have thought they'd found the secret to playing the market. And what happened? Well, this isn't a theoretical plan. This has already worked. Proven. Already worked? I set myself a goal, an amount of money I felt sufficient to live on. In ease for the rest of my life. $50,000. Beyond that sum, I would not attempt to go. Fifty thousand dollars? Yes, I've placed every dime to use, according to the plan. And I've not missed one. Herbert, you... You mean you have fifty thousand dollars? Well, not quite, but we'll have by the first of June. Well, I can't get over it. I'm amazed. Well, it's very simple. I have got three thousand to go. And then I'm through. Three thousand? Oh, that frightens me, Herbert. Why don't you be satisfied with what you have... You may lose it all in trying to get the other three. Oh, not a chance. I set myself a goal and I intend to reach it. <laughs> Very well. I hope you're right. Uh, then, then I'm going on a long vacation. How long will you get? Oh, from next June on. On and on. From June on? Well, how can you do that? I'm not going to work another day. Why should I? I'll be independent. I'm going to quit. Quit your job? Yes. And take a long trip to South America. I'm going to live there. Why, uh, 50,000 there is like 200,000 here. <laughs> what more could you ask for? I see. And you, you're going to get married? Yes, yes, I am. I haven't asked her yet, but I'm confident. Who, who is she? Do I know her? Yes. She's wonderful. Well, I, I wish you lots of happiness, Herbert. Uh, would you like to live in South America, Hazel? What? Well, yes, I would. Then you and I will be married June 1st. Oh, Herbert, you, you mean you're asking me? Yes. Now, don't say a word about this. Now, it's a secret. Don't tell a soul. Promise? Oh, yes, yes, Herbert, I promise. Oh, darling, I, I thought you were never going to ask me. Oh, I want to surprise you. Oh, I've never been so thrilled in my life. Now, I've got to run along now, dear. I'll see you later this evening. Yes. Everything is working perfectly for Herbert Lang. A ten-year plan just cannot fail. A few months from now, and he will be independent. Hazel, 50,000, and South America. It's after three now. The board meeting is over. Herbert steps confidently to the president's office. Well, I see the meeting's over, Mr. Faber. Yes. Yes, come in, Herbert. I, uh, talked it over with the board. They didn't seem to agree with me. Oh, no raise? I'm sorry, Herbert. Board members are rather a cold group of individuals. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Faber. I've gotten used to it after all these years. They're a very selfish lot. A whole lot of stock. Someone else does the work. They draw big dividends. That's all they're interested in. Oh, I hold stock too, Herbert. Oh, I know, sir. But uh, you take a more personal interest in the employees because, well, you're an active officer. Oh, yes, of course. Oh. Well, maybe they'll see their way clear next year. I'm certainly not one to become impatient. No, Herbert. Uh, I'll run along now. Oh, just a minute. I haven't quite finished. Oh, no, sir? I, uh... <clears throat> I had quite a session with the board. For the life of me, I don't understand one of them. What do you mean, sir? They were up in arms about that lady shortage. Oh, but I had nothing to do with that. Uh, do they think I took oh, it? Or... No, no, certainly not. But, well, they do think you are indirectly responsible. Brought up the fact that the five men you've hired in the past ten years have all been sent to the penitentiary. Oh, but how can I tell by looking at a man that they were all recommended? The board thinks you've been working too hard, Herbert. And you need a rest. What? They've instructed me to give you an extended vacation. Extended vacation? How long? Indefinitely. Effective in two weeks. Oh, but, but that's impossible, Mr. Faber. I just couldn't do that. Uh -huh. well, I have a tremendous amount of special work on the books. I just couldn't attend to that in the next two weeks. The board at first wanted well, your vacation to be effective tomorrow night. Well, that's ridiculous. You know that. So who else here could step in and take over in a moment's notice? I... Yeah, of course. Uh, that's true. 
Uh, do you think you could straighten things around in two weeks? If you had special assistance? Special assistance? Uh, oh, yes, but I won't need any help, sir. I- I'll be able to handle it myself. Well, as soon as you finish, take a nice long trip. You need it, Herbert. Very well, sir. Oh, uh, yes. By the way, the board has voted you a $500 bonus. Have they? They only give a bonus on retirement. Why don't you tell me the truth, Mr. Faber? Sorry, Herbert. That's the way they feel. Nothing I can do about it. Oh, you'll uh, let me hear from you from time to time. Huh. Retired at 43. Huh. Well, good night, Mr. Faber. The moment Herbert steps out of Faber's office, fear, a strangling, clutching fear grips him. Two weeks, two short weeks. That wasn't part of Herbert's plan. This is something he hadn't counted on. He's 2,000 short of his 50,000 gold. He'll have to let it go at that and be satisfied. And only two weeks to fix the books to cover the new $1,000 shortage. Night and day he works alone, works feverishly. Then on the tenth day, he has accomplished his plan. The book's balanced. Everything is perfect. Things worked out sooner than I expected, Hazel. We didn't wait till June. We can be married tomorrow and sail the next day. I've arranged passage. Why so soon, Herbert? Oh, I thought we could have a regular wedding. No, no, I think we better leave now. Sooner the better. Oh, all right, Herbert. Whatever you say. Yeah? Uh, good evening, Mr. Evans. Anything you or Mrs. Evans wish, just press the button. Uh, thank you, Stuart. I'll arrange for your deck chairs in the morning. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Mr. Evans. Uh, Why did he keep saying Mr. Evans? Ever? Did he say Evans? Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Evans. Strange. Must have confused us with someone else. I'll put him straight on that in the morning. What did you do with the passports, Herbert? Well, they're in my coat. May I see mine? Yes, of course. Later, we'd best get along to dinner now. I always thought a person had to appear and sign his passport before an official. Oh, no, no, not always. May I see my passport, Herbert? What's wrong with you, Hazel? Please, Herbert. I'd like to see it. Very well. There you are. Herbert, why are we traveling under the name of Evans? Well, it's better that way, incognito, you know. How did you get this passport without my signing for it? This isn't my signature. Who signed it? Uh, That doesn't matter. I got it, Uh, you better study that signature and be able to copy it when we arrive in port. <laughs> don't worry, darling. It's done this way every day. I don't believe you. You're hiding from someone, running from something. Oh, that's silly. $50,000. The stock market. Uh, what are you getting at? Now I am suspicious. Are you, Hazel? You stole that money. Stock market. Well, you never made a dime on the stock market Aren't in your life. Aren't you being a bit silly, Hazel? So this was your plan. A uh, Stealing from the bank and blaming others. That's what happened to my brother two years ago. That's why he was sent to jail. All right, Hazel. You're in this too now, so I'll tell you. I did have a plan, and it worked. No one will ever be able to trace it to me. And I'll take care of your brother later. I sent all the money to a man in Brazil, a man I know. Sent him several packages and asked him to hold them pending my arrival. He doesn't know what's in them. What man? Well, his name is Pedro Gonzalez. Big coffee plant outside of Rio de Janeiro. I see. You and I are the only ones who know, Hazel. Supposing I tell what I know. You'll be an accomplice. But my brother will be cleared. I told you your brother will be taken care of. The only way my brother can be compensated is to be cleared of the charge. No, is that so? And I intend to clear him, regardless of what happens to me. Hazel, you're being awfully silly about this. Uh, Last call for dinner, Hazel. Come along now. I don't want any dinner. Oh. Then uh, let's step up on the top deck. Let's just talk this over. There's a lot of things you don't understand, Hazel. I'm sure I can explain things to your satisfaction. I certainly need some fresh air. I'm terribly sorry to have upset you like this, Hazel. Tossing liner plows on through the darkness. The wind sings mournfully through the masts and cables. Herbert cannot sleep. Herbert is worried. His plan worked. It was perfect. 
They'll never trace the money to him. But Hazel presents another problem. It is morning now, 9 a.m. The steward steps up to Herbert's stateroom door. But Hazel, why don't you look at this sensibly? is isn't as though I'd done a murder. Why do you can't so? You aren't the first woman who's discovered something about her husband. I made a mistake, and I'm sorry. It's done in the past. Now, why not look forward to the future together? Uh, yes? Uh, you rang, sir. Uh, yes, I... Uh, well, my wife isn't feeling well this morning, steward. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, sir. I'll have something sent down, darling. Is uh, breakfast still being served, steward? Yes, sir, for a few minutes yet. Uh, then come along, please. She'd better have something light, huh? A grapefruit, coffee, and dry toast. Yes, sir. And um, how about a soft-boiled egg? Well, uh, is she seasick? No, no, she isn't seasick. She's just emotionally upset, you know. You know how a woman uh, gets some time over nothing. Oh, yes, I know, sir. I think an egg will be nice. Very well. Grapefruit, coffee, toast. Dry toast. Dry. And an egg. Take about 15 minutes or so. Uh, Here's the coffee shop, sir. You get quicker service here. Oh, thanks, Stuart. And uh, good luck, sir. What? Huh? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I married myself, and I know how it is. Women are just naturally suspicious creatures and jealous of everyone. Jealous of your past and your future. Yes, I know. And uh, how long have you been married, sir? Uh, not long. <laughs> well, uh, she'll get over it. I'll be sorry. Get over what? Well, I just couldn't help hearing when I came to your door just now. You pardon me. I better get my order in. Oh yes, it's after nine. Uh, by the way, if you're in the mood, there'll be games and contests on the after deck topside, starting now. Horse races, fifty cents a ticket if you care to gamble. I know, I know, but I don't gamble. Oh well, then you'll find plenty of other things to keep your mind off your troubles. See you later, Stuart. Herbert steps into the coffee shop, orders his breakfast. But try as he might, he can't keep his mind off his troubles. His troubles. And Hazel. He ponders over the thousands of dollars in the cork-lined waterproof package hidden in his trunk in the stateroom. Wonders if Pedro Gonzalez will meet the ship outside the harbor as planned. Fifteen, twenty minutes pass. Then... Mr. Evans! Mr. Evans! Yes, what is it? I, I, I... What's wrong with you? It's your wife, sir. It's your wife. What what are you trying to say? She, uh, she isn't in the stateroom. No sign of her. Well, she must have decided to walk around. No, no, no. Will you calm down, please? Look, look at this. I found this on the dressing table. A note? Let's have it. It it, it must have just happened, sir. It says 9, 10 a.m. Herbert, I cannot reconcile myself to such a situation. The very thought of being married to such a man as you... Sickens me to the depth of my soul. I can't go on. And don't think you will escape punishment for the suffering you've caused. Goodbye. Hazel. He jumped over. Nine ten. Just twelve minutes ago. Oh, it was a little fool. I'll, I'll phone the bridge. Give me the bridge. She was out of her mind. Bridge? Uh, stop ship. Man overboard. Man overboard. <laughs> ship leans over and puts about. They scour the choppy seas for over an hour, circling and circling. Herbert stands beside the captain, peering wild-eyed into the water. Finally, the captain gives up hope, orders the ship to resume its course, and invites Herbert to his quarters. Sit down, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Come in, steward. Yes, sir. Well, we've certainly done our best, Mr. Evans. No one can deny that. Yes, captain, I know it. And I appreciate your efforts, but... He is very choppy. It would be hard to find anyone. As you know, we'll have to ask a few questions. Yes, as I understand. This note was written by your wife at 9.10 this morning. Yes, sir. Do you recognize it as her writing? Well, of course. It's hers, all right, Captain. I checked with her passport signature. Uh, Mr. Evans, how long have you been married? Just a few days. We were on our honeymoon. The tone of this note indicates that your wife was terribly upset about something she had discovered. That's right, I... I tried to reason with her, but she refused to see my side of it, I guess. Uh, what was she referring to in the note? Well, I can answer that. I'm not asking you, steward. Oh. What was she referring to, Mr. Evans? Well, she was referring to another woman. She'd found out about another woman, a woman I'd known previous to our marriage. Did your wife threaten you? No. Did you threaten her? Well, certainly not. Uh, when did you see her last? Well, it was at nine o'clock this morning. She was so upset, she didn't want to go up to breakfast. I, I decided to go alone. I... Rang for the steward to bring us something to the room. Uh, that right, steward? Yes, sir. After the steward left, did you go on deck with your wife? Well, no, I, I left with the steward, went to the coffee shop. That's where the steward found me and showed me the note. Yes, sir. 
As I stepped up to the stateroom to answer the call, I heard them arguing. I heard Mr. Evans asking her to forget about the past and think of the future. Yes. And he told her he'd have me bring something down. Him and me walked along the corridor up to the coffee shop. He told me what to bring her, and I got it. And when I returned to the room, she wasn't there. I found a note on the table and ran for Mr. Evans. Then I phoned the bridge. And you didn't leave the coffee shop, Evans? Oh, I did not. Ask the coffee shop steward. Uh, are you trying to infer that I pushed my Certainly wife over Certainly that... not. Uh, we just want all the facts. We're on the high seas, you know. And this represents a court of inquiry. A uh, coroner's jury, so to speak. Uh, I see. Uh, Mr. Goodman, my first officer here, the ship's doctor, and I will make a decision. What's your opinion, gentlemen? Well, according to the steward's statement and the note, I'd say suicide. Mine is the same opinion. Very well. I agree with you. It's quite obvious that she committed suicide. Enter the findings in that manner, Mr. Goodman. Yes, sir. I'm very sorry about this, Mr. Evans. Please accept my condolences. That'll be all, gentlemen. And so Herbert, very sad, but far less worried, goes back to his stateroom to think. Ten days later, the sleek liner checks speed and prepares to stand off outside Rio de Janeiro, awaiting the arrival of the pilot. Dusk has fallen. The ship barely creeps along. Herbert stands at the aft port rail, a package in his hand, a cork-lined waterproof package. Many small boats bob about on the surface, moving at a snail's pace. As the first officer moves forward, Herbert speaks to him. Why are we stopping out here? Well, we always stop at this first light to wait for the harbor pilot. Oh, oh. How much longer before we get in? Oh, we'll tie up in about an hour. Stand here for about ten minutes. Pilot's on his way out now. Uh, I see. Uh, uh, what's the name of this first light here? Well, it's called the Cordoba Light. Thank you. Why don't you come up forward? There's nothing to see from back here. All the excitement will be up ahead. Yes, I'll go up there in a moment. Uh... What's that you have there? Huh? Oh, oh this. Camera? No, no, it, it's uh, some manuscripts. Why the oilskin wrapping? You think we might go down? <laughs> oh, no, I... <laughs> well, I guess I am a little superstitious. After all, we, we did sail on Friday the 13th. <laughs> well, I'll see you up for it. The ship comes to a dead stop, and Herbert peers over the port rail into the dusk. He scrutinizes each small craft, waiting, watching for the signal. The signal from Pedro Gonzalez. Then, after several minutes, a tiny launch approaches the ship very slowly. And just as it reaches the port quarter, a tiny red light flashes on and off. Herbert cups his hands around his eyes and focuses on the one man in the little boat. The light signals again, Pedro Gonzalez. Herbert looks up and down the deck. He grabs a little flash lamp from his pocket and gives the answering signal. Suddenly, with a swing of his arm, he tosses the waterproof package down to the water. He's got it. Good work, Pedro. The man grabs the package, and the little launch moves away and heads up the coast as the liner churns off up the harbor. Herbert smiles a smile of relief and steps briskly with self-satisfaction toward the bow. And now, three hours after docking, Herbert waits in a little waterfront cafe, waits impatiently for Pedro Gonzalez to keep the rendezvous. But Pedro is already an hour late, and Herbert has begun to worry. You would like more wine, senor? Huh? Oh. oh, yes, please, I'll have another wine. Uh, by the way, waiter... Uh, do you know of Pedro Gonzalez? Pedro Gonzalez? Say, si, senor. Oh, uh, have you seen him this evening? No, senor. Oh. Well, bring me the wine, please. I'll, I'll wait a little longer. See. Si. Buenas noches, senor. Huh? Pedro, where the devil have you been? I have been on my way. You got the package all right? See, si, I got it, Herbert. I'm sorry I'm so late. Oh, I, I was beginning to think you'd run out on me. Where have you been? Run out on you. How could you think such a thing? I'm sorry, Pedro. It's just upset. I well, guess. I knew you would be worried, but there was nothing else I could do. I was worried, too. 
What do you mean? I was followed by another boat. What? See? And no sooner had I pulled away from our ship and headed up to my cabin than another boat started following me. What kind of a boat? I do not know. It could have been a government cutter. So I headed out to sea and then caught in behind them. They kept right after me, so the minute Be I... Be careful, some boys. I never going to say this. Hmm? Why? Oh, uh, uh, no, no, gracias. Uh, we are leaving at once. Gracias, senor. Come, Herbert. Let us get away from here. My car is outside. We will drive up to my place on the coast. Of course. Uh, here you are, waiter. I bought this shack on the beach I told you about for this purpose. A fisherman's shack. Do you know what I call it? Casa de Nero. <laughs> House of money, eh? I have done a little fishing, but only as an excuse for having the boat. <laughs> well, how is everything in New York, eh? I always liked New York. Did you? Perhaps next year I will go back there for a visit and live in style, eh? Of course, you will have to stay down here for quite a while until this blows over. Maybe not. They can't raise anything to me. How much did you get? Well, according to our agreement... Your share should be $5,000. $5,000? Beautiful one! But look, I want to know about this boat that follows you. Well, I was plenty worried, so instead of landing at my place, I landed half a mile up on the beach. The second I got out, I picked the spot and buried the package in the sand. What? I was afraid they would follow me to the shack. Oh, but you agreed that you'd hide it under the floor in a gas can. I ask you, Herbert, what would you have done? I was not taking any chances. Oh, and just where did you bury it, Pedro? Oh, it is easy to find. A half mile up the beach and 50 feet from a small... What is it, Pedro? What's the matter? There is a car following us. What? Maybe it's the police. Police? Step on it, Pedro. Why should the police follow us? Hurry, Pedro. They're gaining on us fast. It is wide open. Ah, they have turned left. It was not the police. Pedro, look out, those kids! Eh? What? Going on the road! <laughs> Pedro, you, you didn't hit them. Pedro, are you all right? Pedro, can you hear me? Pedro, Pedro, tell me. Tell me. Tell me, where is it? You've got to tell me. The money. Pedro, where did you bury the money? You can't. You can't die. You've got to tell me. Pedro. Pedro. Pedro, where is it? Poor Pedro was dead, quite dead. And with him died the hopes, the plans, the 20-year plan of Herbert Lang, the perfect crime that ended in failure. Herbert was a thief, but worse still, he followed it up with murder. Oh, yes, Herbert killed Hazel, choked her, and threw her over the first night out. She wasn't in the room that following morning. The steward only thought she was. And Herbert himself forged the suicide note. For two years now, a thin, emaciated, glassy-eyed figure has been wandering around a Brazilian beach, digging holes in the sand. No one knows why, and no one cares. Just another simple-minded derelict. And poor Herbert Lang will go on digging for a long, long time. I know. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, The Whistler... Return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>